There we are. Innovative construction and operational techniques. So um, there's quite a broad subject, as you can imagine. And for anyone who's come here wanting to know the latest innovative construction uh, and operational techniques, maybe you've come to the wrong place, which, um, given the title, is a little bit strange. But I'll moving on, I'll explain more later. Because it's such a broad subject, I'm taking a little bit of a step back and to what that actually means. But I'll just say a little bit first about um, the, the practice. Um, of That's also uh, something that I'm involved in at the moment. So I'm Managing Director of ECD Architects. And uh, just a, a shameless plug there for a, a book that's coming up uh, in the next uh, three weeks. I think it's due to be published. But um, that is something that uh, I think most of you in the audience probably know Passive House. If I did a show of hands, I'm sure the majority of people would know Passive House. But uh, Enefit, do people know Enefit? Hands up, anyone knows Enefit? There's a few. Well, Enefit is um, the refurbishment standard um, for Passive House. Um, and there's a, a book coming out shortly, but I'll moving swiftly on. <laughs> um, so I'll tell you a little bit about um, ECD, what we do, and then I'll talk about innovative construction and operational techniques. So ECD have been around for about nearly 40 years, 40 years next year. Uh, energy conscious design was set up um, by the founding partners on the back of the oil crisis in the 1970s. And we're heavily involved uh, in the 1980s in writing, helping to write the, the BRIAM method model. Um, so we've been uh, um, involved in uh, sustainable architecture for a very, very long time, uh, working in housing, education, different sectors. Um, so that's us, that's our London team there, some of whom are in the audience today. Um, and uh, we, we want to make a, a difference to people's lives, and we want to create sustainable buildings uh, and work uh, for buildings that uh, endure and inspire. So um, just a, a selection of the kind of the things that we're doing and we're involved in at the moment. Um, but more importantly, actually, it's about how we work. And uh, that uh, reflects, in some ways, the title of, the, of this talk. Because um, on the left-hand side there, uh, that image or selection of images there is about how we manage information, how we bring our designs together. And we do that, obviously, nowadays digitally. Um, and then sh how we bring that together, the architect's model, the, the structural engineer's model, um, all the different disciplines together into that um, uh, federated model, ensuring the quality in the, in the design. And we, we manage that information seamlessly. But also, um, and it's, you might think it's very, very different, but actually we think it's very similar, very complementary in terms of quality. On the right-hand side, you've got a, an image there which is about Passive House, which we were founder members of the Passive House Trust. Um, and it, we believe in um, the importance, the, the use of that tool for um, understanding how buildings perform. Um, and actually trying to make simple buildings. So buildings without all the kit that can go wrong, all the ongoing maintenance costs, just getting the fabric right. Several speakers have, sp have spoken today about the importance of just getting the fabric right and investing in the fabric. And that's what we try to do. So yes, we do some off-site innovative construction as well, but um, it's, it's really about the fabric um, and lessons learned. And I'll come back to that later, how we learn the lessons from the buildings that we design. No building is perfect, and it's important that we make sure that we capture that information and move on to the next building. And as, as a, an industry, that's something we're not good at. So the airline industry has shown for a long time the black box technology, the importance of sharing that information. If no airline wanted to share it, then we wouldn't have moved on very much from the 1960s. So the, the building industry still got a long way to go there. Um, so the, the subjects of the talk, innovative and sustainable. And sustainable is kind of, you might take as red, really, because we're all here at Sustainable Architecture Festival. But innovative construction doesn't necessarily mean sustainable. Um, we would hope it would be these days. You would expect it um, to innovate in a sustainable way. But it doesn't have to be sustainable. But we obviously want to show that it can be. So <laughs> if you Google sustainable architecture, <laughs> <laughs> for long enough, <laughs> you will find an image like this. And who is to say that is not sustainable? <laughs> I have my doubts. <laughs> but um, 
does it really, does it have to look like that or does it look more like that? And some of you might know that uh, selection of buildings. That's uh, in Norwich, that's a passive house development um, at Carabrook Road, which is uh, finished about uh, two years ago, I think. Uh, by the way, can everyone hear me okay? It's a bit crackly. Yeah? Okay, fine. Um, so does it, does, it, does it look like that or does it look like that? And I suppose it depends on your context and depends if you're in Southeast Asia, perhaps. And, uh, but the main thing is, what it, whatever it looks like, it has to be real. And as you can see, that's not real. That's a CGI image. And I think there is obviously a danger with a lot of green wash, a lot of um, buildings which seemingly green, but actually not green, that they can uh, trap the unwary client into thinking that uh, that is a, a green solution. So, so something's happened to the sound. Are we still good? Yep. Good. Okay. So um, how do they perform? That's a, that's a key thing. Uh, it's all very well saying something sustainable. It might look sustainable, but actually uh, a building like this, which looked sustainable, this is the BRE Millennium building, uh, Millennium House. It was finished um, in the Millennium, designed 1998. But actually, in terms of energy performance, very poor. Um, so it was retrofitted um, in the last few years by the BRE to bring it up to um, a much higher standard. But when it was built, it was the equivalent of the Band E, uh, which is actually less and lower than the average UK uh, home in terms of energy per, uh, uh, kilowatt hours per, squ per square meter per year. So quite seemingly sustainable, looks sustainable, Sounds sustainable, isn't sustainable. Or is it something like this, which is perhaps looks more um, simple, domestic, um, also uh, built within, well, within the last 10 years, this one, in Wimbish for Hasto Housing Association, a passive house building, 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. So uh, a much better building in terms of operational uh, energy, not necessarily Embodied energy, as we heard earlier, that's a different subject, but in terms of operational energy, it performs and it's proven to perform. Does it just apply to existing building, uh, new buildings? No, existing buildings like this one as well. Um, and in fact, as mentioned by Carrie, I think in one of the earliest uh, talks this morning, 85% of our buildings will still be here in 2050, uh, 2050. So it's the existing buildings that need to be tackled uh, as a priority. And this was a building that uh, we were involved with uh, in Portsmouth, a big high-rise block, which was completed last year um, and designed to the Enefit standard. So um, do innovative construction materials look like this? Do they look like graphene uh, in concrete, as mentioned earlier uh, by Elaine? Uh, what about nanocrystal structures? Is it are these? Is this innovative materials, or do innovative materials look like this? Traditional materials reused, um, and perhaps the answer is both. But it's actually ensuring that they uh, are well <laughs> that they they perform for a start, and that they, they don't um, uh, well the the the, the, the carbon associated with those materials doesn't outweigh the benefits. So cork and timber, straw, hemp, clay and lime, all natural materials, particularly if they're locally sourced, obviously a good choice. Um, but whatever the material is, whether it's an innovative uh, graphene or, or nanocrystal or a traditional material, the key thing is that that material can be tracked. And that goes back to what I was saying at the beginning about um, how we manage our information of, of the buildings, that, of the materials that we use and the buildings we create. Um, it's becoming more widely understood the circularity of, uh, of construction and, and reuse of buildings and the passporting of, of uh, materials. So uh, what did it take to extract that out of the ground? Uh, what is it um, going to take to uh, demolish that building and then the process of, of reuse? How is that managed? And as you can see on the right hand side there, some of you might have seen this uh, graph before, but that's just the split between embodied carbon and operational carbon. Uh, so the blues are typically uh, the um, operational carbon. Back in 2012, we're obviously reducing our carbon down to 2050 levels. 
the majority of it is operational at the moment. The vast majority is three quarters. In fact, more than three quarters is operational. But as you reduce that, the proportion of embodied carbon becomes more and more important. So that's, uh, that's UK GBC data, but uh, it's just worth bearing that in mind. So um, what about the operational techniques? What are operational te techniques anyway, and, and for who? <laughs> um, is it the design? Is it how we design? So this is how we designed in the 1970s and 1960s, and it uh, looks quite nice <laughs> um, compared to the 1990s. Um, and uh, yeah, is it, is it the way we design part of um, the problem or part of the solution? And nowadays, many of us are working in a, in a, uh, in a BIM environment, building information modeling environment. And is that a more sustainable method of design? Because actually you can share information more quickly. You can uh, avoid some of the, of the uh, delay. Possibly, is it possibly not, is it, uh, for discussion perhaps. What about the construction? Are we saying that traditional methods of construction are uh, not sustainable? Should we be looking at modern methods of construction in all cases? And it doesn't necessarily look like this, it doesn't have to be volumetric, but are we looking at uh, simpler or uh, faster means of construction uh, with MMC, mod modern methods of construction, and is that more sustainable? And then, very importantly, it's how we manage this data. So, the many uh, asset management departments in the 20th century and now look like that. <laughs> uh, and how can you manage something that you you can't understand what you've actually got? So, uh, I've met clients recently who discovered. Uh, on quite a large campus that they actually had a ground source heat pump that covered the entire campus. They didn't know that before we arrived. It was built less than 10 years ago um, because they've got an asset management uh, filing system, a database like that. Uh, you, you need to be able to improve the way you manage your buildings in order to make them more sustainable. Too many buildings don't perform as intended and that's part of the reason why. So should we be moving over to a a 21st century asset management system where we understand how our building performs and we know the operational life cycle, we know when that, that component is going to fail, uh, and how can we encourage our clients to go down that route? How can we use the models that we are creating to help them uh, achieve that? So this is just one example um, of a, method, a sustainable method of delivery. So, um, I don't know, if you're familiar with Energy Sprong, anyone in the audience heard of Energy Sprong? One or two? Um, so it's the Dutch for Energy Spring. So this is a scheme in Nottingham, which was completed uh, end of last year, I think. And uh, there's two schemes in the UK now, but it, essentially it's retrofitting the, uh, buildings quickly and um, efficiently. So uh, a, a typical retrofit, a typical um, project to uh, overclad, whatever it is, uh, an existing building in the UK might take uh, several months. Uh, the idea with Energy Sprong is that these components are all factory assembled, brought to site, and delivered within a week or two at most. So, is that more sustainable? Um, it's also a financing system as well, how you can um, improve the delivery through making it easier for people to pay for the, the, the products, of the, the components that you're using to um, improve the building. How can they pay that within 30 years? So there's another example in uh, Essex that's completed this year. So uh, how am I doing for time? So, okay, just check my time. <laughs> my best helper here. Um, so, methods of measurement, they are incredibly important. If you don't understand what you've done, uh, you haven't measured it, then how can you improve it? And studies have shown by uh, SIBC that uh, UK buildings can perform anywhere between two and five times worse than uh, designed. So, understanding that gap and addressing it in the design, but also monitoring it at handover and post-handover is crucial. 
So uh, these diagrams here, which you might not be able to see at the back, but on the right-hand side, that's a selection of uh, about 100 buildings in the City of London, uh, that data collated by the Better Buildings Partnership, showing that um, this is a, the band A properties and band G properties at the bottom there, and this is the actual energy consumption. So worst performing across here. And you can see that some of the band uh, E and D properties are performing better than the band A properties. Why is that? So that, it's, that um, level of research is not widespread, but um, we need to be able to share our, uh, understand how our buildings really perform in order to make them better. And the carbon buzz, which some of you will doubtless have used, uh, is still only a, a tiny fraction of the um, UK building industry is using that portal to uh, record how our buildings perform and uh, we're guilty, guilty of that as well so you know we've only got one or two buildings up there but uh, there, there needs to be many many more but clients also need to be happy for us to put that information up there so um, understanding how the buildings perform is crucial understanding uh, what you've actually got beneath that concrete or that timber or that behind that wall um, because you've got the model which shows you what you've got and that data is held digitally and is transferred to the next owner or the next asset manager when the, the previous one retires. That information isn't lost so we understand uh, what we've actually got as a, for our buildings. So in summary, uh, I would say sustainability or real sustainability, not greenwash sustainability, uh, can be achieved, but it requires uh, uh, or it must be driven by a quality, a quality in design, in construction, uh, delivery, how we actually uh, finance it, uh, the management process, and the measurement at the end. So that's all from me. Thank you. <laughs>